Well, good morning. Happy Easter. What an honor it is for us to have you worshiping with us today. Welcome to Walden Community Church. My name is David Kenny. Uh, it's Easter. Wow, today is Easter, and well, it's the reason why we're all here, right? It's a, it's a day we look forward to. It's certainly the most important day on the Christian calendar, and certainly Christians believe this is an important day. That's, that's why we're all here. But what about all the people who are not here? I don't mean here, here, but what about any church, okay? The people who are not in a Christian church service today, what about them? Because only 41% of America goes to church on Easter. Now, granted, that's a lot, but that still means that there's 59% who don't. I mean, what's up with them? Do they... Do they know something that we don't know? Well, I think one objection that I've heard, and perhaps you've heard this too, is what's the point, right? Aren't all religions basically the same? And with that question, I think there's certainly an underlying idea. And that idea is no single religion is true. And that would make others false, right? That, that's an intolerant viewpoint. No, the woke idea would be that all religions are the same and no one religion is better than any other. Like people, right? Like ideas. All should be accepted. All should be considered. All should be tolerated. None rejected. But is that really true? I mean, are all religions basically the same? Well, no. I mean, for instance, you might think that all religions worship a god. That's not true. Or that all religions have a holy book. That's not true. Or that all religions believe in a soul or an afterlife or some sort of moral code to live by. That's not true. Some say that all religions, well, then at least teach the same basic core truths. I mean, sure, they might use different words or they might use different symbols, but their message is the same. Well, I don't know. I mean, consider the two largest religions in the world. You would have Christianity and Islam. The Christian doctrine of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the Trinity, foundational for Christians, but that concept would be very wrong to a Muslim. And while both Christianity and Islam both teach that God exists, Buddhism would say that God does not exist. So clearly it's not true that all religions are basically the same. It is true that many religions are similar, but I think you'll find that Christianity is vastly different. I mean, one difference is Christianity is the only religion that teaches salvation is a gift from God. That means there's nothing you can do to earn grace. Most other world religions are about you doing the work. You be better. You try harder. You earn God's favor. Christians, we call this free gift good news. So why does it seem like the rest of the world doesn't see the message of Jesus as good news. Why does it seem like the rest of the world can appear so anti-Christian? I mean, if Christianity is good news and it requires so very little of us, why is Christianity so scary? You know what I think? I think it has a lot to do with control. See, another key difference with Christianity and other religions is that Christianity takes all the power and all the control away from us and it puts it entirely on God. Because even if other religions admit that there is a God, they still support you being in charge of your own life, taking control of your own life. Now, I don't know about you, but I love it. <laughs> I love it when someone says that I'm not in charge, 
right? Or that I'm not responsible for the outcome. So you'd think Christianity would be a relief, but it actually backfires. Let me show you what I mean. Let's look at the origin story for all humanity. Bible, Genesis, chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I can't imagine a better situation than the Garden of Eden. You literally have all of nature at your beck and call, right? Any want or desire you have satisfied. And the only rule is don't eat from this one specific tree. And when the snake tempts them with the fruit, notice the snake doesn't say, come on, aren't you hungry? Right? He doesn't tempt them with a basic core need. No. What does he tempt them with? Control. Right? The snake says, when you eat this, you will be like God. And let me tell you something. That desire in us hasn't changed. Am I wrong? I mean, who doesn't want to be number one? Who doesn't want to be famous? Who doesn't want to be in charge of all of it? All of us seem to have this ingrained desire to make ourselves God and to have control. We want to have control over our own life, apart from God. We want to be able to do it ourselves, through our own effort, and at the same time, we also want to do it better than everybody else. Because if we're doing it better, then our name will be at the top. And I wish I could say that that human desire goes away when you become a Christian, but it doesn't. But let's go back to the question of all religions being the same, and, and let's approach it from a different angle, okay? Let's, let's consider what's true, okay? Let's look at truth. Now, some might say, well, since all religions are the same, I mean, just choose whichever one works the best for you. Now, that does work for clothes and cars, buying a house, not religion. I mean, if you ask me which ketchup is best, I would say, choose whatever works for you. If my wife sends me to the store and she wants me to buy ketchup, trust me, I'm going to buy the one that's the cheapest, even if it's by pennies. But with religion and the fate of my soul and heaven and hell and reward or eternal punishment, I can't just treat religion the same way that I treat ketchup. I mean, choose what works best for you. Don't you think you'd have to go with what's true? Don't you think that's the right way? I mean, isn't it irresponsible for me here to choose how I feel? I mean, if I could pick the afterlife that was based on my feelings, I'd go with Valhalla, right? Viking heaven. <laughs> talk, about, talk about a heaven that's created uh, by men. <laughs> in Valhalla, you fight all day, and then in the evening, you eat barbecue pork and you drink beer all night long. Forever. But if Valhalla isn't true, then it's really stupid for me to hope that it is. Just because I want it to be true? Just because that's how I feel? We can't choose an afterlife based on our feelings. What if you went to go buy groceries and your card was declined? And you, you knew there was money in your bank, so you called your bank and said, hey, what's up? And your bank said, well, today, we just didn't feel like you had money. Would you want those people to be in charge of your money ever again? Of course not. Now, I hope you're 
life is more important to you than where you bank. Religion is about devoting your life, especially with Christ. It's about submitting, it's about obeying a higher authority. And, and don't just hand your life over to a whim based on how you feel or what you prefer. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus was a real person? I mean, do you believe that he was a real person? I mean, probably, right? Good for you. Because, well, that's really 92% of America. 92% of America believe Jesus was a real person. I mean, it's hard not to, right? Because his reach and his influence is way too great for him to have been fictional, right? I mean, he had to have been a real person. Okay, so the only other question that's relevant for today is, do you believe Jesus died on a cross and that he was dead for three days and that he came back to life? Now, people could then say, well, how would we know, right? How would we know? They, and they didn't have cameras back then, obviously. Uh, people were probably not as smart as we are. Uh, science has really come a long way, advances in forensics, and you know, wasn't his entire trial kind of uh, rushed? I mean, it was all a botched job, right? I mean, it's possible that just a lot of people were very confused, right? Maybe, but the question remains. The story is either 100% true or it's 100% not true right? This is what one Bible writer said. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Got it? Clear as mud, right? <laughs> That's actually a passage of the Bible in the English Standard Version. Now, I realize sometimes the Bible is a little hard to read, a little hard to understand, so let me give it to you, that same passage in modern English. If dead bodies can't come back to life, then Christ can't either, because he was indeed dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark and as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and resurrection because they're already in their graves. If we all get out of Christ as just a little inspiration for a few short years, then we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. That's easy enough to understand. He says, if it's not true, then we're really a sorry lot. But if it is true, then it's a legacy that we should all want to be a part of. So you're here, I'm here, let's roll up our sleeves and figure this out, right? And I know I probably should have spent uh, a ton of money uh, buying every single guest in our church a, a little gift or Maybe we should have hired professional musicians for our music, or I should have had 20 greeters out there in, in the parking lot making sure that everyone welcomed you to church. And we had you know, free pictures out there with the Easter Bunny. But you know what? My job right now is not to make a sales pitch for our church. I have 30 minutes-ish, and I probably should put my best foot forward and, and do everything I can to make sure that you come back next week. But instead of talking about us and instead of talking about why I love our church, I would rather use this time to talk to you about Jesus. Is that all right? So what do we know about Christianity? Well, we know Jesus' followers taught that he was the Son of God, that he died and came back to life. We know there were people who claimed to be witnesses and who could tell stories of not only seeing Jesus die, but also seeing him alive after the events. In fact, the earliest Christian missionaries were wandering teachers who traveled from community to community. And in those early years, the Bible hadn't even been written yet. So uh, teachers would just tell stories and pass them down by word of mouth. In the early centuries, Christianity achieved 
phenomenal growth. And it's estimated that only 350 years after Jesus, Christianity had grown to 30 million followers. And sure, dozens and hundreds of other uh, little startup religions appeared after then, uh, other prophets, other teachers, and they probably flourished for a little while, but they died out and Christianity continued to grow. Now, those are historical facts. But aside from that, there is a claim that they are making that Jesus died on the cross, that he was dead for three days, and then after three days, people saw him walking around. Is that a fact? I think so, but can you prove it? Well, no, of course not. (laughs) But technically, we can't prove lots of things. I mean, before cameras, before recording equipment, all we have is what is written down. I mean, how could anything be proven? So what are you left with? Well, you're left with what's the most plausible, right? Was George Washington a real person? Okay, prove it. Well, well, you can't prove it, but we can certainly believe it because it is the most plausible. Even though none of us were alive over, what, 220 plus years ago, and none of us saw saw him with our own eyes, I mean, there's no doubt that Washington was a real person. We can read his writings, we can view his portraits, we can visit his estate in Mount Vernon, but even if he had never left behind any sort of artifact, we can still show that he was a real person because we have the testimony of other people and his impact on the world. Same with Jesus. We apply that same rationale. What's the most plausible? And like I said, most people agree that he was a real person. So the only other question is, did he die on a cross? Was he dead for three days? And did he come back to life? Well, what sounds the most plausible? One theory is, well, Jesus didn't really die on a cross. He didn't, he didn't die on a cross. Muhammad teaches that exact same thing in the Quran, that Jesus did not die on a cross. The assumption is somebody who looked like Jesus took his place. So Jesus had uh, had a stand-in, right? He had a stuntman for the cross. Remember, it's either one or the other. It's true or it's not true, right? He either did or didn't. So the two major religions disagree on this single point. So if they disagree, clearly one is right and the other one is wrong, right? If he wasn't on the cross, then the Romans crucified the wrong guy. Is that possible? I don't think so. Matthew 27 says, then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagged their heads and saying, you who could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. We will believe in him. Who was was there? Who was at the foot of the cross? His accusers, right? The people who wanted him dead showed up. And if Rome had crucified the wrong guy after they had gone through all that trouble and all that headache to put him on the cross, they would have said, hey, that's not the guy, right? Others said, well, then Jesus didn't fully die. I mean, he's on the cross, sure, but then he fainted, and then he regained consciousness later, and then he had just escaped. Okay, so that means that he endured several trials at night without sleep. And then He was whipped after that, beaten after that, within an inch of his life, crucified, which means hung vertically as the blood from his body ebbed out. And then everyone thought he was dead. They stabbed him in the side. He was given no medical treatment. They wrapped him in a burial cloth. They placed him in a tomb behind a rock and established guards outside that 
He then felt better, gathered up his strength, moved the stone aside, snuck past the guards, and left. Does that sound plausible? No. John 19 says, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Is that significant? Yes. Why is that significant? Well, because these these ignorant, non-science believing backwater witnesses recorded that event. Is that important? Yes, because it proves that Jesus was dead. And that's your medical evidence right there. Long before we knew about things like this, let let me read, okay? Prior to death, the sustained rapid heartbeat caused by hypovolemic shock also causes fluid to gather in the sac around the heart and around the lungs. The gathering of fluid in the membrane around the heart is called pericardial effusion, and the fluid gathering around the lungs is called pleural effusion. So the fact that someone recorded that water and blood came out of his body proves, long before they knew about such things, that he was dead. Okay, so maybe he did die, but then when they went to go to the tomb, they just went to the wrong tomb, right? They went to a tomb that was empty and they just assumed, oh, he's risen from the dead, right? They, it's the wrong tomb theory. Does that sound plausible? No. Matthew 27 says the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples go and steal him away and tell the people that he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now, Jesus' tomb would not have been hard to find. (laughs) How do we know? Big rock on the door. (laughs) is sealed with a seal, right? It's secured. And there's guards standing in front of the rock. If I was trying to give you instructions to go to the new Panda Express and you came back and said, it's not there, would I believe you? Of course not. And what what would be the first thing I would ask you? Where did you go? Did you go right next door to Chick-fil-A across the street from Kroger? Because that's where it is. Oh, wait, that's not where I I went. Well, there's your problem. Is it possible that people went to the wrong tomb? Sure. Would anybody else have believed them? No, because all you'd have to do is say, no, not over there, over there. (laughs) Right? All it would have taken was somebody else to go out there and say, no, you went to the wrong one. Right? Matthew 28 says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow, and fear of him and the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran and told the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while he was asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep ourselves out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Look at that. There was already a conspiracy theory back then and the Bible doesn't hide it. The Bible doesn't cover it up. The Bible says, yeah, sure. There was a theory 
the, the Jesus' body was stolen by his disciples theory. And there are people today that still believe that too. Does that sound plausible? No. Because what you're telling me is these poor Jewish fishermen who first ran away at the scene when Jesus was arrested and they were way too scared to even return to be there for him at his crucifixion, they later gathered their strength and their courage, went to the tomb and overpowered the guards, rolled the stone away and stole the body. I mean, I get the plan. It's a great plan, but what do you do next? Right? I mean, okay, so we're running through town with a dead body. Then what? What do you do with a dead body? Plus, if your religious leader is executed and you had placed all your chips down on him, that's probably a good time to say, well, I guess he wasn't the guy. Right? That's more plausible than someone saying, or we dig him up and we steal his corpse. Right? 1 Corinthians 15 says, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. People saw him die, and the Bible says over 500 people saw him alive. Okay, mass hallucination. Really? Okay, sure. People were more superstitious back then, right? Maybe they just imagined it. They saw what they wanted to see. Okay, but we're talking about a lot, a lot, a lot of people. We just read the women at the tomb, Mary Magdalene, right? We know that Peter went and saw Jesus. Uh, the, the two on the road to Emmaus saw Jesus. It, John 20 records 10 disciples seeing him. Uh, Mark, Luke, and John all record 11 disciples seeing him. John 21 has seven disciples seeing him. Uh, Matthew 28 says the disciples saw him in Galilee. Uh, 1 Corinthians says that James, his own half-brother, saw him. In Mark and Luke and Acts, the disciples see him on the Mount of Olives. And then, like we just read in 1 Corinthians, 500 people at, saw him at one time. That's way too many people. That's too many people. And it's also unlikely people. Why, why do I say unlikely? Well, because if you're going to lie and say you saw him alive, then, then say at least that a judge saw him or a lawyer or a priest or a king. Don't make the witnesses women and Gentiles. Well, people lied. Okay, people lied. Maybe, maybe. But how far would you go to support a lie? I mean, how far would you take that lie? In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned to death for preaching the gospel of Jesus. Eleven of the twelve disciples were killed for their testimony. I mean, how far would you be willing to go for a lie? Blaise Pascal says, I believe the witnesses who get their throats slit. What's the most plausible? That's why we're all here, right? Jesus actually physically died on a cross. He was dead for three days, and then he came back to life. When you weigh the facts and compare it with what's the most plausible, you have no other choice but to believe. Okay, so a guy dies, he's dead for three days, he comes back to life, and what? What do you do? I guess you do whatever the guy says, right? I mean, somebody pulls that off, pff, buddy, you're in charge, right? <laughs> you're in charge. Matthew 28, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When someone comes back to life, right? When someone rises from the dead, you should listen to what they say. And the first thing he says is that he has all authority 
over heaven and earth. All authority over life and death, right? As opposed to you, you, you had no influence over when you would be born, right? You had no control over that. And you'll have no control over when you'll die. And, it, and when you die, you won't be able to change your mind and reverse that decision. Jesus says he alone has authority over two things that you have no authority over, heaven and earth. Why would you listen to Jesus? Why would you follow Jesus? Because he alone has the authority. He has the authority over life. He has the answers to life. Why would you listen to anyone else? I mean, what does that mean for us today? Well, it means that if he is it, right? He is all. He is everything. Apart from him, there is nothing. He is ruler. He is king. And it doesn't matter if you believe him or not. Because if he is the true authority over heaven and earth, it has absolutely nothing to do with how you feel. Don't base your choice on what you believe or who you follow based on how you feel. I have enough feelings and I have enough emotions. I have enough struggles. I have enough stress in my life. More and more, I am being forced to tiptoe around everybody else's feelings, and it's becoming a circus. So I need truth in my life. I need constants in my life. I need permanency in my life. Why is the good news good? It's good because it's true. Philippians 2 says, God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Where is Jesus' authority? Heaven and earth. And one day, the Bible says, all creatures on heaven and earth will recognize that authority. Listen, I know you're here with me right now, and it's Easter, and you really, I mean, you could be here for any number of reasons, but I want to argue that you're here not because you were forced, and not because you were <laughs> bribed, or because it was a habit, or because it's expected. I would argue that you're here because God loves you. And if Jesus died, and he rose again three days later, and if he has authority over heaven and earth, then that gives credit to all of his miracles. It validates all of his teaching. If Easter is true, that's the most important single event in all of human history. And, if you, and even if you still doubt, don't you want it to be true? You should. Author Tim Keller says, each year at Easter, I get to preach on the resurrection. In my sermon, I always say to my skeptical, secular friends that even if they can't believe in the resurrection, they should want it to be true. Most of them care deeply about justice for the poor, alleviating hunger and disease, and caring for the environment. Yet many of them believe that the material world was caused by accident and that the world and everything in it will eventually simply burn up in the death of the sun. They find it discouraging that so few people care about justice without realizing that their own worldview undermines any motivation to make the world a better place. Why sacrifice for the needs of others if in the end nothing we do will make any difference? If the resurrection of Jesus happened, however, that means there's infinite hope and reason to pour ourselves out for the needs of the world. Don't you have a built-in desire for hope and meaning and longing? Things like death and shootings and poverty and war and hate. 
they don't get the last word. Not in this world, not in the world I want to build, not in the world I want to be a part of. I believe hope and love and peace get the last word. Jesus had all authority in heaven and on earth, and he preached a message of love and peace and hope. So no, all religions are not the same. Jesus has the last word. Do you believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus? Do you believe that it actually happened? And if you do, then do you follow him? Do you obey him? Most Texans would say, yes, yes, they believe. 77% of Texans are Christian. That's a, that's a bigger percentage than a lot of other states. So now what? Let's go fishing, right? Let's go fishing. That's what the disciples did after Jesus was resurrected. You know how that is. There's a, there's a conflict with the main character and then there is some worry, there's a little stress, and then the conflict gets resolved and the story resets. John 21 says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he was revealed in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out, got on the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet with the disciples did not know what, that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put off his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in on the boat, dragging the full net of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land and saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Wow, that is an amazing fish story, right? A hundred and fifty-three fish. A hundred and fifty-three. That's a very specific number, a hundred and fifty-three. In fact, the number is so specific that it has caused a lot of discussion about what it means. But let me tell you something. I alone know what it means. I do. I, I, I know the significance of this number. Are you ready? Okay. It means someone can count. And someone remembered the number. Of course they remembered the number. They're, they're, fishermen would not forget a number like that. And when the story was written down, the number is given so clearly and it demonstrates an eyewitness account. Fish were caught. How many? 153. Then what? Breakfast. Breakfast was eaten. And this is the third time Jesus appears to his disciples after he's resurrected. But most importantly, the number of fish reminds us that we can believe the things that are written down. We can trust that they are true. And since they are true, we shouldn't be afraid to release control of our lives to the one who has authority over heaven and earth. We put the authority and the control back in his hands where it belongs. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Religions are not all the same because no other preacher, no other teacher, no other sage or guru ever uttered those words. Only Jesus. Look, I would love for you to come to our church. Love it. But to be honest, I can't sell you on a big budget church. We don't have uh, pyrotechnics and flashing lights. Well, I'm, well, I mean, we do have flashing lights, but they, they're, they're only flashing because they're broken. But here's what I can promise you. 
we are your neighbors. We're your neighbors, and my kids go to school with your kids, and my house is down the street from your house, and we also want to make a difference. We want our lives to matter because we believe that Jesus matters. But see, there's no single church that owns the market on truth, just like there's no single church that owns the market on Jesus. So please, yes, absolutely, choose a church that works the best for you and your family. And if you decide to come back next week, I promise you, you will save a ton of money on gas. But I can also promise you that together, you and I, we will pursue truth and life and the way because we're going to pursue Jesus and we can do it together. But if you've never made that first step, if you've never received that invitation and you think that you're finally ready to place control back in God's hands and to follow him, to obey him, to be his, then I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize that I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself, from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I wanna repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become everything you made me to be. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I would strongly encourage you to plug in to a local church. Find the church that's closest to you. It doesn't have to be big or small. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? Plug into it and begin to walk with Jesus as a disciple and begin to offer that church your talents. God has equipped you with talents and strengths that nobody else has. You have a personality, you have a unique gift that is only yours. And God wants to use that. He wants to use you to continue to spread the word. Now, does that mean you're gonna be a preacher and stand at a pulpit like this? Maybe, who knows? But it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, God is gonna strengthen you. He's gonna pour into you and he is going to save you every day. God loves you. And there is a community of people that now wants to receive you and love you. Find that family and plug in and continue to walk in the Lord. Take confidence that he has risen. He has risen indeed. Have a blessed Easter and a great weekend. I love you guys.